Good evening, my dears. Well, we are gathered uh, once more, this time to uh, consider uh, a great work of uh, comic genius, uh, Jacques the Fatalist and His Master, by uh, Denis Diderot, who uh, wrote this uh, for his own amusement and that of his friends, uh, whether he knew that it would be some centuries before it was truly appreciated. There were individual readers who loved it, but it wasn't really un wasn't until the 20th century that uh, this work became widely admired. Uh, I hope he, he knew or he anticipated that this would happen <laughs> one day. I hope he didn't doubt too completely uh, whether what he was doing was worthwhile, but maybe he enjoyed himself enough while he was writing it that this doesn't really didn't scarcely matters to him. At any rate, we are left with uh, what is the ultimate meditation on how, uh, how our attention is held uh, by a story. When uh, the storyteller himself or herself uh, decides to mock the very idea of our play of attention and the very significance of those uh, details and realistic uh, set dressing that usually attend uh, a story that holds our attention. So, uh, from the very beginning, uh, the very opening uh, paragraph makes it clear in what uh, disregard the author holds the conventions of storytelling. How had they met? By chance, like everyone else. What were their names? What's it to you? Where were they coming from? From the nearest place. Where were they going? Does anyone really know where they're going? What were they saying? Well, the master wasn't saying anything. And Jacques was saying that his captain used to say that everything that happens to us here below, for good and for ill, was written up there, on high. And with that, uh, the whole meal of the book is set out. Uh, both in the author's <laughs> deliberate insults to us, which which constantly recur, and the author will turn to us and say, what do you care? What's it to you? How dare you quiz me on such questions? <laughs> Meanwhile, um, the uh, uh, Jacques himself will uh, tell us uh, yet again what his captain, when he was uh, in the army, used to maintain which is that everything is foreordained anyway. Um, and uh, so it's, it's, it's hardly worth debating or uh, disputing uh, anything, what's going to happen, what has happened. It's all, it's all up there in the scroll, uh, high up there in the sky. Um, it, it has been maintained uh, of this book that uh, Jacques is a fatalist, as the title says, but not a determinist. Uh, this is a little too heavy duty for me, but if I understand rightly, a determinist uh, uh, just says uh, it's all it's all sorted, whereas a fatalist believes that it is, and yet we have some free play in our actions, or we think we do, only subsequently to discover that we don't. I'm not sure that that makes a distinction between fatalism and determinism. And if any of you have a clear idea of what that distinction is, do let me know, because I seem to be somewhat in the dark about it. So that uh, is the issue that is debated through uh, the next two, three hundred pages without there being a resolution, because indeed, who could prove whether things are, uh, are written or not written? Uh, I believe I told you um, I forget when, maybe it was during the Zoom meeting, uh, about the scene that Robert Bolt, the screenwriter, wrote into his uh, movie of Lawrence of Arabia, uh, where uh, the main character saves the life uh, of a young man lost in a sandstorm against the advice of, of uh, his surrounding companions, uh, Arabs, faithful uh, loyal, pious Arabs who say, don't bother, he's, he's done for, it's written. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, Lawrence brings the boy back alive, 
which defies the concept that it is written, only to find that he actually, he, Lawrence, has to execute the boy, who turns out to be a thief, and uh, there's no choice, and Lawrence does it and storms away through the camp <laughs> with two of his friends saying, what's the matter with him? And the other explaining, well, that the boy, the boy he executed, that was the boy he saved from the sandstorm. And the first one says, ah, so it was written. <laughs> and that story is often in my mind when uh, reading uh, uh, Jacques the Fatalist, I think it's a, a delicious conceit on uh, Robert Bolt's uh, part, the, the author of Lawrence of Arabia, the movie script. He may have plucked that uh, from some famous source or else uh, in his own uh, genius he, he created it as a model uh, of uh, when we think we've got one up on destiny and its wiles. So through this book uh, we are allowed to speculate uh, without any hope of conclusion <laughs> as to whether things are pre-planned or are all uh, happening. I think that uh, maybe um, the distinction where fatalism and determinism are concerned uh, inheres in uh, Jacques' conviction that there is a scroll up there that is being unrolled um, little by little, slowly, gradually. It's not all already there and you can go and have a look and, oh dear, you know what's going to happen. You don't know what's going to happen because the unravelling uh, is a slow process that happens at the same time as living uh, that which is being unravelled. Uh, maybe that's not it, but that seems to be the way Jacques uh, uh, imagines it. In any case, that doesn't uh, uh, last us very long. It doesn't sustain us uh, through the whole story, uh, that dispute. It keeps on coming back uh, because uh, Jacques' uh, master uh, recognizes that Jacques will always see things as foreordained, uh, something that he himself cannot do. What really sustains us uh, through the telling of the story, despite the storyteller's determination to say, what do you care? What's it to you? Who cares? These are, these are, these are, these are, your questions are meaningless. And to refute the idea that there is significance in who these people are, where they're going, where they're coming from, uh, despite this, what holds our absolute attention is the question of uh, Jacques, the servant's love life. Uh, he promises us the story of his love life. Uh, his master, that's the one thing he wants to hear, is the story of Jacques's love life. And Jacques keeps on putting off the story of it. And we go on and on, uh, thirsting to find out if there is one story that we want to know uh, the progress of, that we want to discover the details of in the history of storytelling. It is a love life. So Diderot very cunningly uh, puts us at the mercy of that revelation. And I, I can uh, promise you, and perhaps one shouldn't give these things away, but it is all written, of course, on high. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's slowly being unraveled from the great sky grow, that you will not be entirely disappointed uh, when you get to the end of this long story full of amazing digressions, characters who you meet and never meet again, anecdotes that are too wonderful not to revisit and yet we never go back to them, and uh, among other uh, significant stories, one huge tale which qualifies as a realistic uh, story. Uh, the, the story of Madame de la Pommeraye uh, and her, her love life. And it's, that's such a wonderful story in and of itself that it gave rise, has given rise uh, over uh, the 20th century to uh, uh, plays and films um, because it's such a beautiful story uh, that it's hard to resist wanting to dramatize it in a conventional way. It's a conventional story, but beautifully told cleverly told by Diderot, who thereby shows us that he is not at the mercy of his clowning, that he is in fact a master of the conventional tale, which makes it even more impressive, I think, uh, that he can continue to clown his way uh, to the end of the book. It's a, a long-standing tradition, uh, this kind of clowning and mockery of storytelling itself, 
uh, it goes back to Cervantes uh, and to many great authors, all the way up to, to Brecht, um, who liked to let all the air out of the tires of realism and still make one care. Uh, so that in, in Brecht's theatre, instead of uh, seeing an elaborate set that told you you were in China, what you saw was a signboard that said China. And that that was, uh, would be quite enough. And correctly so. Um, we only need, want to know or need to know the facts of the case. They don't have to be decked out in beautiful decor. We want to know what happens next. And that's the simple fact of storytelling. And uh, what happens next now <laughs> is that I will let you go uh, to go and read it. Um, and, uh, and I hope uh, enjoy yourself. Um, one important thing that I need you to know, and I hope you've hung on long enough to uh, to receive this, is that there's a problem about uh, the asterisks that fill the text, which are clearly uh, references to notes at the end. But the question is, where? Where are the notes to be found? Uh, the book itself runs uh, 352 pages, I think, from uh, page 38 in this edition to 390. And the notes uh, have a, a, a number beside them, which you would hope will be the number on which the asterisk uh, is, is marked. Unfortunately, not so, because the, uh, the asterisk notes, the notes at the end, are 240 pages long. There's, there's 240 pages worth of them. And yet uh, there are 352 pages of them in the text. So there's a, a relationship with them. Somebody, one of you might be able to figure out uh, an equation whereby uh, you could uh, go directly from, let's say, page 100 to the note, which would therefore be on page 132 or 187 in the, in the notes. Uh, maddeningly, that's how they're laid out. And obviously they relate to an edition which was 240 pages long, but is not the one you're reading, the 352-page uh, one. So uh, what could be more maddening? You don't absolutely need these notes. They're, they're interesting. They relate to uh, historical and geographical specifics uh, of the period, which uh, it, it, they furnish a feast um, which you couldn't possibly have without the author supplying them. There's a lot of detail in them and uh, an, an interesting detail, but uh, it, it will not kill you to be without them because quite clearly uh, the chief uh, message of the play to you, the reader, is what's it to you? <laughs> so I, I think you're absolutely free to take that taunt of the authors and say, well, it's nothing to me. Tell me what it is that I should be interested in, and I will keep reading. So hopefully you will uh, uh, do so, as, as many later novelists have. The great Czech novelist Milan Kundera, who uh, prizes this novel greatly and indeed made a stage play out of it, uh, which I know has been put on at least once, I think, at Harvard, uh, somewhere equally high-minded with Susan Sontag, the famous critic directing it. Um, the review I read of the production was not very encouraging, but it shows great respect on the part of one celebrated novelist for another, and I feel very happy that, that Diderot has got his due uh, after the uh, centuries of waiting, uh, and after he expended so much delicious ingenuity into spinning this mockery of storytelling for our delight. So I hope you enjoy my dears, and I look forward to reading what you have to say about it, and I look forward to seeing you again while we continue on its journey next week. Bye.